Hi, everybody. I am going to talk today to you about how women in open source lead in times of coronavirus. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Merle Kranz. I'm a former board member of the Apache Software Foundation. I was also conference chair last year at ApacheCon in Berlin. I am currently the treasurer at Apache, and I'm also an individual contributor for uh, a couple of different humanitarian, that's what the H and HFOS stands for, humanitarian free and open source software projects. For example, Apache Finract, and I also did a hackathon for OpenMRS a couple of years ago. So first let's ask what makes coronavirus so challenging? Why is this such a difficult problem to solve? Well, if we look at it from multiple sides, we can see, for example, coronavirus has a huge economic impact. Even without the lockdown, the loss of life, the loss of time uh, has, a, has just a significant amount of cost to humanity. Finding reliable and accurate information about coronavirus and about its effects can be difficult. Um, the information flow and relationship building that we perform in the world today has been interrupted by social distancing and um, by the changing work situations. So those are problems that we have to solve. There's a, there've been massive changes in government assistance as governments have stepped up to uh, strengthen their social network. There've been increases in spending. There've been changes in programs that have been, that need to be communicated and brought to the people that are meant to help. Secure data exchange for legislatures has been a problem. Um, voting for legislatures who aren't there and who have traditionally insisted that their members be there. Homeschooling for parents uh, who still have to work while they're solving all of these other problems. There have been sudden massive changes to supply chain, chains, differing needs, uh, factories no longer able to produce, factories needing to produce different things, transportation being interrupted. Um, and elder care without, with, with social distancing has also been a problem. So what do all of these problems have in common? Many of these problems, even all of these problems, are wicked problems. And wicked problems is a, is a sort of problem, a kind of problem that has been recognized since the early 1970s. Um, wicked problems is the classic paradigm or, or rather is, is a description of a problem for which the classic paradigm of science and engineering fails. Um, the paradigm that has underlain modern professionalism just doesn't work in these kinds of problems because they're system problems, they're cyclical, they're societal problems, and they're inherently different from the problems that engineers deal with. So what is a wicked problem? Well, it's not just a hard problem. It's a problem that moves away from you when you try to solve it, or even moves away from you when you try to understand it. So a wicked problem is a problem for which knowledge is incomplete or even contradictory, um, for which there's a huge number of people and opinions involved, also contradictory. It's a problem with a large economic burden, at least within its context. Um, and it's, it's very interconnected. The, there are not only cyclical dependencies, there's multiple cyclical independencies. So it's a system problem. It's a system problem in which the parts have um, no clear separation from each other. There's no definitive formulation of a wicked problem. So for the coronavirus, are we balancing the coronavirus transmission against economic damage? What counts as economic damage? Um, Wicked problems have no stopping rule. That is, you don't know when you're finished solving them. How much coronavirus transmission is acceptable? Do we really want to set that at zero? How much disease transmission in general is acceptable? Solutions to wicked problems are not true or false. They're good or bad. They're moral problems. Um, and when a problem is a moral problem, then, then conflicts that stem from competing value systems come into it. Um, questions like questions of self-determination versus the care for the societal good arise. There's no immediate um, or ultimate test for the solution of a wicked problem precisely because there's differing value systems from which you could approach it. Um, every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. You do it. Um, 
But once you've done it, you can't do another experiment and say the situation is the same because it's not. Every solution changes it. There's no A-B testing. Um, there's no innumerable set of possibilities as to how to solve it. But every wicked problem is unique. So for example, coronavirus transmission in Japan is different than coronavirus transmission in Italy because family living situations are different. Willingness to wear masks is different. Population density is different. So the solutions are going to be different. Um, every wicked problem can be considered to be a symptom of another problem. So um, you might consider coronavirus a symptom of people not being willing to wear masks. But if people wear masks, then they might spend more time in groups, which increases coronavirus transmission. Um, it's Sometimes uh, it doesn't work the way you expect it to. Um, so the existence of a discrepancy, a thing that you want to change, uh, can be explained in multiple ways within the context of a wicked problem. And then here I'm going to take a step out of the coronavirus for a moment um, and talk about the riots in the U.S. Are riots caused by police violence? Or do riots happen because protesters get violent? Or do riots happen because rioters are angry about injustice? Well, depending on which explanation you choose, um, that will change what approach you take to solving the problem. So the planner doesn't have a right to be wrong, but the planner is almost guaranteed to be wrong, to move back to coronavirus. Every mistake costs lives, and even good decisions are going to end up costing lives. And there's no way to go back and say uh, that you did the right thing because you can't go back and try a different thing and compare. So how do we as computer scientists and programmers typically solve problems? Well, the first thing we do is we try to create a clear definition. We break problems into their component pieces. Or we perform root cause analysis. We find the problem and we look for a problem that caused that problem. And we look for another problem that caused the, the second problem. Well, these are good approaches for, for partial problems, but they're not sufficient for wicked problems. So we just determined that a clear definition of the problem um, might not help us actually understand the problem because there might be multiple contradictory equally valid clear definitions breaking the problem into its component pieces might not actually be possible and following root causes might bring you right back to the beginning because problems cause themselves um, with wicked problems so wicked problems can't be solved with these steps what we need is a non-linear approach and fortunately, we already have practitioners in our community who do do nonlinear approaches. Those are our designers. Design thinking is a nonlinear process. Designers have to gain a deep knowledge of their community rather than a superficial knowledge of the problems. Designers need to develop meaningful relationships with the stakeholders or even be the stakeholders themselves. Um, designers must remain accountable for their project, and they must deal with very large time scales. And designers um, within a social entrepreneurship need to, to focus on depth over the over impact of breadth. So just to give a couple of other examples of wicked problems that we're not going to dive too deep into, but that might help you understand what a wicked problem is. Global hunger is an example of a wicked problem. Diversity in the STEM fields is an example of a wicked problem. Police brutality is an example of a wicked problem, and global warming is an example of a wicked problem. And if you're interested in looking at ways, at, at approaches, sort of generalized approaches to, to solving these wicked problems, you might be interested in reading a book called Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard uh, by Chip Heath. This is a side note. So this all sounds very depressing and very negative. One of the things that is suggested in the book that I just uh, mentioned, Switch, is that rather than look at the bad parts, we look at what's working. We look at um, we look for bright spots, areas in which we seem to be doing better than in other areas. So let's do that. Let's look at where we're succeeding against coronavirus. Well, Berlin buzzwords, it seemed appropriate to bring up that Germany is doing very well. Now, it's not perfect. We don't have zero cases and we don't have zero deaths. But given the degree to which Germany is networked with the world, this is actually a pretty good result. With a population of 80 million, Germany has had 186,000 cases, um, 8.8 thousand deaths. Um, the death rate for infected people has been very, very low. 
and Germany has managed to to, to start stopping uh, transmission within within its borders. Finland has done extremely well. Um, they managed to keep the number of deaths down to 323. Now it's worth noting Finland and Germany are fundamentally different countries. Finland has a much lower population density than Germany. So the solutions that, that apply in Finland might not apply in Germany and the other way around as well. New Zealand has had uh, only 22 deaths and they just recently announced that they've got the number of cases on the island down to zero. So they're starting to open businesses back up. This is a massive success. Taiwan, border with China, which is the first place that the coronavirus broke out, and they were confronted with making decisions before coronavirus was as well understood as some of these other places that I've listed. And yet, despite that, they've managed to keep the number of cases below 1,000 and the number of deaths below 10. Now, this is really, really impressive. So what is different about these places? Now we found our bright spots. Now we need to figure out what makes these spots bright spots. So we've got Germany, Finland, New Zealand, and Taiwan. What is different about these places? Well, let's look at who leads these places. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel is shortly before her retirement in politics. She was able to communicate the risks of the pandemic very clearly to the population and credibly. Um, Santa Marina, she's only 34. She's the youngest serving state leader and 12 of 19 members of her five party cabinet are women. Um, Jacinda Ardern shut the, the economy of Finland down extremely early. It was a risk averse approach, but it's brought New Zealand to a place where they can now fully reopen their economy. And Tsai Ing-wen used testing and contact tracing very intensively and very quickly in order to control infections without a full national lockdown. So those numbers that she managed to achieve were without a full national lockdown. So if we look at these spaces, do we see a pattern? Is there something in common that these people show? Well, yes, they're all women. Contrast this with Donald Trump, who has chosen not to wear a mask because he wouldn't portray himself as strong enough that way, or Boris Johnson, who basically tried to negotiate with the virus and delayed lockdowns and other measures. So does that mean that women make better decisions? Is that what I'm trying to say? Well, no, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. Um, but it is worth noting that these are women. Maybe it's not the fact that these are that these women are the leaders of these countries, but rather the fact that these countries were willing to elect women that these were the best people for their roles and the countries were, these countries were able to recognize that and put them into those roles. These four women are stunningly capable and they were able to rise to the main leadership positions in their countries, which doesn't just say good things about them, it also says good things about their countries. So what they managed to do is they, they, they come from a society that values diverse opinions. And this is, this is an important point. Because avoiding groupthink requires people with diverse backgrounds to have a seat at the table. People need to feel safe bringing those diverse perspectives to the table. People need to listen to and understand each other's perspectives. So diverse voices matter. Um, Angela Merkel's government, for example, considered a variety of different sources in developing its coronavirus policy. So they included epidemiological models, they concluded data from medical providers, and they looked to South Korea for their successful programming of testing and isolation. They were pulling in data from every direction they could find it. Remember we were saying that wicked problems are system problems with multiple interacting parts? Well, working on these problems requires more expertise than a single person can bring to the table. And putting multiple people with the same background and training at the table isn't much better than just putting one person at the table. Let's look at another example. This right here is a picture of one of the engines of Qantas Flight 32. This is really massive. The, the, the engine exploded in the air, the debris hit the left wing and knocked out multiple other systems. And, um, but you see this thing landed. The crew managed to land the plane safely. So a group of researchers closely examined the major dis airline disasters and crew training uh, and they examined the crisis communication 
um, performed between the crew members while solving these complex problems with hundreds of lives on the line under extreme time pressure. The researchers were especially interested in those cases in which clearly the, the plane was landed safely. So when they examined those cases, they found that the crews that succeeded at those things did two things right. One thing, the captain's style of communication had a major impact on crew performance. First, the crews performed consistently better under intense time pressure when the co-pilot was included in the decision-making process. Now you would think, well, it's an emergency. The, the, the captain needs to know what to do and just tell everybody what to do, and then people need to do it. But that's not what's happening here. When the captain analyzed the problem alone and simply gave orders, um, the outcome was worse because these problems are complex and a single person can't understand, even the pilot cannot understand the full airplane. So second, the captains who asked open-ended questions, that is, how do you assess the situation? What options do you see? What do you suggest? They ended up coming up with better solutions than captains who simply asked yes or no questions. So what they gathered here, what these researchers gathered here was that when captains included their colleagues as equal decision partners by asking them questions, um, this is a form of leadership that Ed Schein uh, terms humble inquiry, then that taps into other people's expertise and it aids them in bringing you constructive and factual information. So societies which include diverse voices are already more likely to be teaching those values of listening, careful decision making than societies which don't. But there's also a reason to believe that women specifically are statistically better at this form of including multiple voices. So research has shown that in high stakes situations, men tend to become more risk taking, whereas women tend to look for smaller, safer gains. Um, and the quality of team decision making isn't determined by how smart a team's members are, surprisingly. Instead, it's determined by how socially sensitive the members of the group are and how well they are able to leverage the understanding and knowledge of the full group of people. Women are consistently more socially sensitive. This doesn't mean that men can't learn it, but statistically speaking, women are consistently more socially sensitive. And so research has found that teams with more women tend to have a higher group IQ. This is, repeat, this is a skill that men can learn. You just have to value it. So good leaders are not risk takers. They value inclusive decision making. They look to enable others and they practice humble inquiry and they're empathetic. So coming back to the problem that we're trying to solve here, how are women in open source combating coronavirus? So I'm gonna get specific and concrete here now. I'm going to introduce four different women working on four different initiatives. Two of them are smaller and more minor um, and solve a very localized specific problem. And two of them are working on larger, um, longer term problems. I'm gonna start with Stormy Peters. Um, Stormy uh, is a leader in open source. And when she realized that a lot of these conferences were, were failing or, or being canceled, fortunately Berlin Buzzwords is doing just fine. Um, she started an open source hallway track. She announced it on Twitter and communicated it effectively and leaders from all around the industry, somewhere between 10 and 15 leaders every week have shown up at these meetings and talked to each other about various aspects of open source from diversity to open source programs, offices, to the relationship between open standards and open source code. And people have enlightened each other and met new people and networked. Aizamal uh, Normamat uh, Kizzi has worked on online trainings um, in Apache Airflow. Um, Meredith Horowitz and a rather large team, not, not to forget the team, have worked, and this isn't new, um, this is just something that's become part particularly relevant now, have been working on a project called Get Your Refund, in which lower income people can get tax advice for free um, via a website, um, and it's a project from Code for America. So when the government brings out new government assistance related to coronavirus, then uh, the poor people at whom it is targeted are now more able to get those refunds via, um, via this project. So the last project I want to talk to you about, I have invited somebody to, to talk to you about it. Um, her name is Claire Barnhorn. 
Now, Claire Barnhorn is working on a project called Solvos, and she's been working on this for uh, most of the last year and a half. Um, so she was started working on it well before anybody knew anything about coronavirus. Um, Claire has been interested in humanitarian aid all of her life. Um, she has uh, she studied it. She's worked in the field. She's worked on the ground, um, working, for example, setting up a field hospital in, in Congo for, for Doctors Without Borders. Um, and in the process of doing that work, Claire noticed that uh, procurements was a problem for these humanitarian organizations. So um, a procurement officer who didn't know much about the space would then go and do a lot of searching to find, for example, an incubator. Um, and then buy the incubator, but maybe forget that she needs to account for spare parts and for training. Um, or uh, the procurement officer might go to a contractor um, and ask the contractor for advice on how to do this. And then the contractor charges lots of money for something that he or she just did just to, for the, the last organization just a few days ago, um, which means that the, the contractors get make a lot of money. Um, and it's an inefficient process. And, and Claire decided that she could see a way to solve that. And um, she started working on a project called Solvas, which should solve that. And I'm hoping that we can add Claire to the stream now and we can start asking her about this solution. Hello. Hi, <laughs> Claire, nice to see you. Very good. Thanks for the introduction. So can I ask you a couple of questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So. First off, can you tell me how you got interested in humanitarian aid? That started, and then everybody can guess my age, uh, in 1986 during the Great Famine in Ethiopia, and I was six years old, and there was this charity run at my high school, or at my primary school, I was a first grader, and I came home running, telling my dad um, and mum that Ethiopia and Yopi were hungry. I wasn't even noticing it was actually a country, but I was just determined to run the charity run, so these two boys would not be hungry any longer. Um, and that's basically where it started and never, never left the business. So um, would you tell me a little bit more about, uh, about your background as well? Yep. Um, you, you mentioned that you had been involved in procurements. How did you get into that? So I started studying tropical agriculture at first at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and I became a master in disaster eventually. Uh, I did my master's in disaster studies. Um, started to work in India, started to do another master's in humanitarian assistance in Dublin University. Um, and then I started working with Doctors Without Borders. And uh, that's what I did for many years. Um, and actually in 2010, I was in the Congos realizing that just due to, due to the fact that I was collecting data on malnutrition rates. And I came into a situation where people telling me that Action Contre la Faim was another organization was doing the exact same things five or seven years ago. So my data was just a, a time, just that at that moment in time, I knew something, but at this data didn't, didn't tell me anything on, um, is it better or worse? Is it epidemic? Is it, what's the data telling me more than just these numbers? So that drove me into data driven innovation and technology in the humanitarian sector. And that has led me eventually to um, to be more involved in innovation, um, where I saw a lot of duplication op opening up. Um, a lot of, yeah, for example, clean cooking stoves. There's even a website on innovative clean cooking stoves, and it has more than 250 different innovative solutions. But it's basically all comes down to the same solution, same innovation. So there was just a lot of duplication. And at the same time, I've seen amazing innovations and they're just chasing one aid agency after the other, or trying to find a use case they could actually provide value to. And I thought this we can do more systematically and we need a system change in the sector. And if we'd like to open up the sector for innovations, we have to start looking at procurement. And that's why the procurement cycle came into existence came into the spot and that's where actually our system approach is now focusing on. So in procurement, you mentioned that, that uh, you've got a lot of people bringing in products. Um, is that the right approach? Is that how, uh, how we're likely to, to solve these problems? People coming up with great new ideas and then trying to get them to the aid agencies? Currently, a lot of that's, that's common practice at the moment. There's a lot of discussions on great innovations and how to scale innovation. So there's tremendous amount of programs to scale innovations. But if you don't present them in the community or in this sector, aid sector, 
for humanitarian development agencies vis-a-vis -vis existing solutions it's so hard to rate them and to, to see what's the value of it or how to even notice about them if you're not at that same conference or not being introduced at the right moment so that's what we're doing we're trying to um, make that systematic and open up this systematically. So yeah. how, do, how do innovators become aware, uh, sorry, how do human, well, yeah, how do innovators become aware of the problems that they need to solve? So what we're having is basically a search engine, an open source catalog. We call it an open access catalog because knowledge is for the commons. Knowledge should be for everybody. And what we're doing, if you type in, I need a generator because you're building an outpatient clinic in Uganda, for example, you don't get the search, you get a search return. Do you need the product generator or do you need a power supply, which is the identified need of the keyword. And then we go back and try to take the, the, the user on a journey with us. And we move away from product dominated thinking into solutions, into what's the identified need that you're after. So you need a power supply. All right, great. We know it's a power supply. What's the next step? Is it a community power supply, a household power supply, a facility power supply? And if you drill down, for example, you need a community power supply, the key requirements or the criteria on which you select your solution package is then coming up. So that's where we work with a lot of experts in the field to open up this expertise. So if it's a community power supply, you will have questions. What's the population density? What's the resource setting? What's the need, etc. cetera? Uh, what's the peak load? What's um, uh, sun hours, etc. All these little details. And the more you fill in, the more narrow your solution packages that the platform will present you will be because it will be more matching to your requirements. And so I meant- So you get complete solutions. That means that, that the, the aid agencies can also see what the total cost is, not just what the cost of that one piece of equipment is. Do I understand correctly? Yes, exactly. So a solution package, we are after responsible procurement. We started with responsible innovation, but it's now responsible procurement. Exactly the example you gave. If you're after uh, reducing the rate of mortality of, uh, of children after childbirth, an incubator is exactly what you're after. But an incubator alone is not a is not a responsible solution package. With that comes the assurance there's enough power available for the next five years. With that comes the service and maintenance contract for five years, because the lifespan is set as a five year for such an incubator. With that comes a spare part kit. With that comes a training of nurses. And if an agency has one or multiple already available of in-house, they just untick that box and they can tailor that solution packages, but you at least know what's what needs to be in that solution package. And there's also the pre-requirements. So we assume that the pre-requirement for an incubator is that there is enough power available. And this is the standard of the power uninterrupted, obviously for an incubator. Um, and if you don't have that, you just tick it and you go down the stream again, and you would just add that to your specific solution package for your clinic in Uganda. Okay. So did coronavirus make this harder? Yeah, uh, actually, um, it made it more visible. So we have done an analysis of all the major pitfalls that we're addressing. So I really mentioned product dominated thinking. We often have a poor knowledge on how local solutions work at field level, or there's no visibility of a local solution. So we have all these major pitfalls. But actually, there came a few that actually made things worse in, in, um, in Africa, for example. So complete supply chains are already collapsing here in I'm from the Netherlands at the moment. That's where I'm based now. So supply chain is already collapsing here for businesses. So imagine what it will be for the aid sector. And also the supply chains are predominantly EU and US centric and they are collapsing. So we have to invest in more localized abilities to procure. So our platform made it even more, it was even more necessary to move fast and speedy to open up. And there's also a lot of competition and then talking here at this um, where everybody's working on open source there is this whole new um, sector that actually joined to support those in need and the responders in the coronavirus uh, crisis is this makers community there's I've seen amazing open source designs the the three-day printing community just they exploded they all start working together but these designs is very hard to flow into um, the aid sector. And that's also what we're trying to incorporate. The solution package is a combination of services, designs, and products. So also these open source designs can just 
create value not only in your own community but far and far beyond so how is so that's those are open source designs you're disseminating are there other ways in which the work you're doing is open source yeah so there's and not a lot of people know that but there's 10 million ngos globally there's 1 million in india but still 9 million on all the other countries in the world and they all do their own procurement and it's all having their own language and when you're in data, you know that you have to have a common semantics. You have to know that you compare apples with apples and not apples with peers. At least you know what we're talking about. So we're providing and creating now open standards and semantics that can be shared within a sector. So we can combine everything and link everything and creating open standards for procurement and open standards for our knowledge base. And similarly, the the solutions catalog, as we call it. So it's merged with a tender platform. I didn't mention that part yet, but the, op the catalog of all these solutions and the search base, it's all open access knowledge. Okay. So can open source software make your work in more impactful in any way? Yeah, obviously in the future. That's something that's high on our wish list. We have released, for us, things have moved so fast because of the coronavirus. Uh, we released a prototype uh, in March 20th, and immediately that weekend, our whole community got together to actually start make it, providing value for the current crisis we're in. So the speed that we are with um, prevented us to do the our preferred scenario. So we're now launching end of this summer, and then we're looking into uh, rewriting and then making continuing on uh, an open source coding uh, stream. Okay, so this is this is very, very interesting, but I'm going to um, stop our conversation here so that people have a chance to ask questions. So Nicole asked, um, you, you mentioned that Apache Finract um, as humani is, is a humanitarian project. Can you say something about its origin and motive? And are there other Apache projects with a similar idea or purpose? Um, so. FINRACT comes from the Grameen Foundation originally. Um, the Grameen Foundation, uh, for those who don't know, um, does, uh, does um, microfinance. That is uh, this idea that if you give people little tiny loans um, to invest in their businesses, they can pay them back and you can keep using that capital. So um, this requires, it's basically creating banking solutions for communities that didn't have them before that. So the Grammy Foundation started creating these, first the Grammy Bank, then the Grammy Foundation started creating these, these little local banks, they're called microfinance institutes, institutions. Um, and at first they were tracking stuff on paper with pencil and that's difficult. Um, then they were doing stuff with Excel um, and then they started working on a, an open source banking solution. Um, and that banking solution was originally called MIFOS. Um, it was uh, the, the MIFOS initiative was spun out of the Grameen Foundation. And the MIFOS initiative donated the back end of that project to Apache, and that's what Apache Finneract is. So um, the, that's the origin of the project, but the motivation of the project is to make it possible, cheaper, um, to offer banking solutions to people who did not previously have them. Um, and there's, there are 2 billion people in the world who are unbanked or underbanked. Um, are there other Apache projects with a similar idea or purpose? Most Apache projects are fairly commercially oriented and most Apache projects are um, less than complete projects. They're more like libraries or components that, that work with other components. But I'd say, um, yeah, I mean, Open Office has similarities because it uh, made it possible for people to um, access their, their office document formats, whether they could afford Microsoft uh, software or not. Um, but in general, no, I don't think there is another project at Apache that's that has similar uh, that that's similar. But the projects at Apache are very different from each other as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, for joining for joining me for this this uh, really interesting conversation. Um, Solvos, I think, has a huge amount of potential. And I think also um, that we have a lot of different people working on the problem of coronavirus and of humanitarian aid in general. And if we just we keep recognizing the difficulties of the problem um, and recognizing the importance of the different perspectives that different people bring to it, um, that we have a real chance of, of making a real difference. Yeah.
that we have a real chance of making a real difference in the world. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.